Vlog number 134, starting it off from the city of Laughlin, Nevada. Down here to shoot a Silver State Sights, but this is not where I will be playing poker, even though it is a cool town. Be back in Vegas, and last time I was in Vegas, you may recall a few vlogs back, well, things went extremely well for me. So the question stands, can they go half as well this time out? The World Series of Poker is going on. I'm not playing in any tournaments. I'm just here to play cash. So we'll see what impact that has and what the games are like and if I can do half as well in them as I did last time. So after the shoot in Laughlin, I cruise back into Vegas listening to some Rise Against. Shout out to Cleveland Dan back in Reno, big Rise Against guy. I get back into Vegas early in the afternoon and the trip begins at the Sahara which happens to be the casino in which I booked a room. One with a lot of mirrors, by the way. It was also the site of a multi-vlogger meetup game, which I jumped into for a few hours and had the chance to meet up with some other vloggers, including Happy Face Hold'em, Fish Poker, Harry B, Dex, and others. I found myself, by the way, really hoping for the first time ever to pick up the Octo Crab and run a big bluff with it, as everyone there seemed to know the vlog, but I couldn't get it. Ended up losing about 100 bucks or so on a night that I focused more on talking to these other guys than actually winning money. The next day, the list was 35 deep at the win, so I decided this was the time to walk across the street to the brand new resorts world for the first time. And it didn't take me too long to find the fish. The casino definitely has the new casino smell. The poker room, obviously very nice. The tables, chips, cards, all second to none, comparable only to the win, if you ask me. And by the way, the thing that it has over every poker room, most comfortable chairs I've ever seen in a poker room. So jealous. TVs are a bit small though, but I'm used to the pepper mill where they put everyone to shame. The structure is 200 to 1200 for the 2-5 game, so I buy in for 1000 and get the four seat in an eight-handed lineup to start. Starting a trip off with aces never sucks. I make it 15 in the hijack playing six-handed. The button is a young Asian guy who has been playing very aggressively, and he three bets to 50, and as I've said before, against tough opponents, I'll often get tricky from time to time. So I smooth call out of position. With 100 in, the flop comes ace, deuce, three, rainbow, which is not a good flop for me because getting action here is often like getting action in a bar wearing a Dungeons and Dragons shirt. It's just not easy to do. So I check, and he bets 35. I proceed to just call, planning on letting him fire the turn as well. With 170 in, the turn is the six of clubs. I stick with my plan and check. He bets 110, and I decide to go ahead and check raise right now, making it 235. And as I feared, he does not take too long with it and finds the fold. I then proceed to raise with the six eight of spades and flop a straight. My flop C bet gets called, but my turn bet does not. We then get an under the gun limp, and I have jack nine of clubs plus one and simply over limp. The button is clearly a pro, and he raises to 20, which we both call. So with 60 in, we go three ways to 887, two clubs. And that's where I started rolling video. Under the gun bets 15, and I call. The button then decides to raise to 50, which the guy on my right proceeds to call. With a straight flush draw, I'm obviously not going anywhere here, so I come along. With 210 in, the turn is the ace of clubs, which gives me the flush. Under the gun, bets out here for 55, and I decide to exercise a little caution here with the paired board and just the fourth nut flush, so I just call, wondering how the button will then play it. He just calls as well. So with 375 in, the river is an offsuit four. Kind of what I was looking to see. Under the gun, bets out for 75. Pretty clear the button does not have me beat here. Or he probably raises the turn. And it's highly unlikely that the four filled him up if he does have an eight. I know that if I'm going to get paid off by worse, I can't raise all that much. So I may get just 150, and the button mucks. Under the gun moans and groans for a minute and says he just has to pay me off here. So he does, and we have a $675 pot. I show my hand, and he mucks. 
An in seat finally opens up so I get a better view of the action. I don't get many hands for the first hour, but I do three bet queens and my flop bet doesn't get called. Then under the gun one opens to 15 and middle position three bets to 40. I have exactly the hand I was hoping to have in the big blind. Not knowing how much this guy would call, I decide on a sizing of 155. It appears that was too much for him to call. Now that's a mistake that I absolutely hate making by the way. It's so hard to get aces in a three bet pot that it's just kind of a disaster to not get action on them. And I think that a sizing of about 100 there or so would have kept his King Jack suited type hands in there. We then get a $15 raise under the gun and a call from the button. I have queen 10 of spades in the small blind that I'm not going anywhere. So with 45 in the flop is jack 8 6 two hearts and no one bets. Turn is the king of diamonds giving me an open ender. If no one wants to bet on this, I'm happy to shoulder the responsibility myself. I bet 35. Under the gun fold, but the button doesn't. So with 115 in, the river is a five. He probably is not going to fold a king here. But if he's hanging around with a hand like 7-8, well, I've got to try to get him to lay it down. So I bet just over half the pot, making it 60. He thinks about it for about 15 seconds and mucks. So we get one through after three hours of play. In a game that's not that great, we're up $375. Then playing five hand that I pick up sixes in the cutoff and make it 20. Button calls, big blind calls. So it's 60 in. The flop comes queen six three rainbow giving me middle set. The big blind checks and I decide to bet small here like I typically do to try to get action from a lot of hands. I just bet 30. The button folds but the big blind doesn't. So with 120 in, the turn is a seven which brings in one of the only draws out there in the form of four five. He checks. I bet 40, and he proceeds to then check raise to 160. So my concern about him having that straight could potentially be a real one. But obviously I'm not folding. Still, I'm hoping for a paired board on the river. And pairing the board when you need it to pair is often a task comparable to pushing a semi-truck by hand with the emergency brake on. Either way, with 440 in, the river does pair the board. It's another queen. He thinks about it for about a minute and then decides to check. Now, I now know that he does not have 4-5, but could he possibly check a queen here? I wasn't sure. Either way, obviously I have to bet. I settle on a sizing of 225, and he doesn't take too long and folds. He said that he was going to bluff the river on a blank, but was not going to bluff a pair. So the fact that it did pair in this instance ends up hurting me, killing my action, not giving me the best hand. But either way, we take down another pot. And that brings us to the hand of the day. A $10 straddle is on under the gun, and I have pocket kings in the cutoff and raised to 35, which the small blind calls. The big blind proceeds to re-raise to 155, and the straddle folds. Now, I decide to just call here, looking to play post-flop against a wider variety of hands. The small blind folds, so we're heads up with 335 in to a Jack Jack Deuce rainbow board. He comes out and bets 130, and I opt once again to just call on a board where there just aren't too many bad turn cards for me that exist. With 615 in, the turn's another Jack. I wasn't sure if he'd want to play a really big pot here or not. Turned out he did. He fires $415. Now, obviously, at this point, I have to be concerned about the possibility of him having pocket aces. But obviously, not concerned enough to fold. So I call, and with $1,090 in, the river is a four. And now, he decides to check. Now, I have about 600 left, and he has me covered. I think that I can rule out him having aces or queens here now that he's checked. He hadn't been giving me action hardly at all for the past five hours. And I felt it was unlikely that he'd want to double me up here with too many hands. It felt like he was shutting down to me. That was my read. And I decided to bet accordingly. 
basically I wanted to bet an amount that he might even consider paying off with Ace King. So I just bet $100 here. And he does not snap call that bet. But after about a minute, he ultimately decides to begrudgingly toss in the 100 And we have a $1,290 pot that obviously we're going to be winning. I never got a look at his hand, but I'm guessing that he certainly was not calling 600 with it, whatever it was. I play for another half hour, rack up, and book the win. All right, wrapping up this vlog over here on the other side of the street, overlooking Resorts World, booking a nice win to start this trip here in Vegas. It's like I left in beast mode and I came back, well, and I'm still in beast mode. Feels good. Interesting hand there with the Kings. I'm not really sure what to say about it, other than the fact that I do think if I had put in the next bet before the flop, that I would have won a much smaller pot. So. I guess the fact that I played it in that particular way worked out for me well that time. All right, let's go to the question of the week. Cardinal Law 9 writes in, Hey Ben, my question is kind of the opposite of the last one. Do you ever have issues that come from being on a big upswing? Do you ever start playing too loose or undisciplined when you're up big? I've heard this described as too much money syndrome. How do you stay focused and not get too loosey-goosey? Interesting question, and it's one that I've definitely been guilty of in the past. Uh, there's regular tilt, where you just get pissed off because you're losing, and then you spew off more money. And then there's winner's tilt. I learned this from Crush Live Poker. And that's when you just feel overconfident. It's like you can't lose and your play suffers. Like, you know, you win a whole bunch of hands and then you say, you know what? I'm just gonna start opening ace 10 off from under the gun in a full ring game. Or I'm just gonna start opening the king nine off from plus two. And when you start doing those things, bad things happen. It's as if you're trying to force the action. Let the game come to you. I think that this session that I had today was a pretty good example of that. It was about a seven hour session and I vlogged almost every hand that I played. I just sat back and grinded, waited for big hands and you see the result. So yes, I've had an issue with that in the past and I can't just sit here and say, well, I think I am completely free of it now. I have to let my actions prove that to you guys and uh, everyone else. But I will say, I think I'm a lot better at both that and regular tilt than I was years ago. And you know, how do you get better with, with regards to tilt? How do you tilt less in poker? You work your ass off and you win a lot of money over years at a time. And all of a sudden, it's much easier not to tilt. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And that was the case for me with both types of tilt because both do exist. That'll wrap things up for part one of this trip to Vegas. And we're back here with more no limit hold'em cash game action next week if you haven't already hit the like and subscribe buttons it's great for the channel and if you want to play on poker bros join my group it's called high society and as i've said you don't need three stacks of it to play i predict you will enjoy the action on there there's a link in the description below use my referral code see you next time <laughs>